we will be hearing a conversation today between these three extraordinary women. Um, Eva Fedorov uh, has a BA in film from Bard College and an MA in illustration from FIT in New York and uh, now an MFA in painting at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She is a two-time awardee of the scholar, uh, Scholarship in the Arts and teaches studio art at Hawaii Pacific University and is the founder and president of CICADA, an organization committed to amplifying the creative response to environmental justice and the climate crisis. Um, Manea, Native Hawaiian artist Manea Lum is based in Honolulu. Her research-based practice ranges from kapa, uh, which is Hawaiian beaten fiber, uh, bark fiber materials to large scale oil paintings. She is a University of Hawaii at Manoa Department of Art and Art History MFA 2021 and BFA uh, in 2014. Um, she uh, won awards in excellence in painting in 2014, uh, the Yoko Radke Award for Excellence in Figurative Work in 2013. Um, she has been a P Pow Wow Hawaii artist and a Puni Space resident, um, and also received the 2018 John Young Scholarship Award and the Dean's uh, Graduate Dean Scholarship in the Master's Study of Painting. She is the current coordinator of the Creative Artist Network Hawaii with the Hawaii Artists, Arts Alliance and an advocate for artist networks to provide resources and opportunities to support artists who are permanent residents of the Hawaiian Islands. Um, and we also have Jenna Macy. Um, her multimedia work often develops from sardonic observation, comparing human behavior to mating rituals as they might appear in nature documentary. Born in Honolulu, she completed her BFA at um, MICA, the Maryland Institute College of Art in 2016, and is the recipient of an MFA at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in 2021, um, as well as currently a John Young Scholar in the Arts. Um, Macy is the recipient of the Wingate Fellowship from the Center for Craft, Creativity, and Design in North Carolina in 2018. She performed uh, in the Honolulu Biennial in 2018 and has exhibited at the Cary Lowe Gallery in Sydney, Australia, and currently has a show up at Apuni Space uh, right now, so go see that. And all three are exhibiting the solo exhibitions in the Commons Gallery at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, and with Nanea's show up currently. Um, and I'm so delighted to welcome them and, uh, and hear their conversation today. So I hand it over to you um, and congratulate you all as well. And we'll have, uh, typically what we've done for these talks is um, let the, the artists present their work and speak and then um, segue into questions uh, in the, the later part of the talk. And you can type questions at any time throughout the talk um, in the chat. And then the artist will call on you and you can pop up and, and ask your question towards the end. Um, and I should also mention this talk is recorded. Well, thank you, Micah. Um, I guess we're gonna start off by each of us just doing a really short presentation of our work. Um, you can all, please, we welcome you to go to the, the website uhmmfa2021.org where you can get a more in-depth experience of our shows and our work and also watch our walkthrough videos. Um, Nanea, do you wanna start since you're sitting in front of your work at the Commons right now? I, I, I can go ahead and be first then. Um, I'm gonna share my screen because on the inside of the gallery, there's, um, our live audience, our gallery audience. So I'm gonna share what's on my iPhone screen and everybody who's inside is looking at the work in person. So what we're looking at is a Valke plant and that um, tree has been kind of navigating my interest in being a grad student at UH Manoa I entered back into this art program um, with a interest in kapwa and that is the um, plant fiber that has been um, taking me into the forest and also into um, communities that I can learn more about traditional um, tools, language and place making. So this Walke plant is growing in the um, Kuka'o o Heiau at Manoa Heritage Center, which is a super 
great um, community organization where um, people are keeping the pohaku there very relevant to culture and um, teaching a lot of students about our Hawaiian history or language history. Um, so I'm handling pohaku in Manoa while also growing plants and transforming their fibers. And that pathway um, is always connected to my painting pra practice because as a traditional painter, I have um, a skill set with uh, some tools and some methods from a painting tradition. But I start considering what I do in my own activity as painting. Um, I'm doing a lot of act, uh, active material, beating the kapa with the hohoa on the kua. And um, when you're transforming the, the wauke fibers, you're actually like looking so closely at how the material is changing that to me, it's a live action painting. And I start doing this outside. Um, I start collecting water and keeping um, a mapping of each name, place name of where I'm gathering water, this, the places that I'm going to with my pohaku and um, thinking about the fiber material that is capturing all of this movement. Um, this video has been in place of a lot of the community orientation that my work is, is activating. Um, I didn't wanna be alone. I wanted to paint outside and interact with Pohaku, interact with communities who are beating kapa. Um, I think that's the quickest presentation of what my intention was going into this work and leaving it open because what I did next was take my canvas fibers and place them in this stream. And so this stream is called uh, Waikeakua in Manoa Valley. It's um, connected to the Naniua pole streams and the ridge line that is connected to Ko'olauloa. Uh, so this is the beginning stage of my process of burying the canvas in the stream and creating an ahu or a um, spiritually significant altar for my, my, my visitation and also my um, collaboration with the Aumakua and all of the um, essence of being in that space and what people, the people before me, how they transformed that space in order to live a very um, healthy, balanced life. Like during the pandemic, it was of great concern to all of us that we check in with our mental health and that we um, have our avenues for like dealing with what's going on. And so I was very blessed to have access to Waikeakua stream and to spend time with these pohaku because what they did for me um, is a lot of like gravity within my own body, like holding onto these pohaku for that time was, was um, it, it was a endurance. And then when, when the full moon was at its like largest and starting to wane, my ceremony with these pohaku was at its end. And so I began taking the pohaku away. But um, we can talk about the artworks when we break for questions. And I'm, I'm just gonna leave my presentation there, Eva. Okay. Yes, and constantly evolving. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, Jenna, do you wanna continue and present your work? Do you wanna screen share? Okay, sure. I think I can do that. Yeah, here we go. So I use a performance-based research in uh, this exhibition, Dry Spell. I'm gonna play this in the background silently. Here we go. Uh, I was researching the properties of sand and desert chameleons to learn a lesson in intimacy from natural phenomena. So both these performances are set to soundtracks from nature documentaries. I'll actually just play the sound on that for a little bit. In 
In order to understand what's making noise within the doom, they've got to be able to hear it. So in setting uh, these video performances to nature documentary soundtracks, I sort of use this imagined lens of reverse anthropomorphism to open up questions about human intimacy. Both video performance pieces draw from a psychological term called the chameleon effect, which is the non-conscious mimicry of the postures, mannerisms, facial expressions, and other behaviors of one's interaction partners in order to develop intimacy in human relationships. So this first piece is called Deepest Darkest Secret Two, Master of Disguise. And that's about communicating a secret to the sand uh, using this sculptural sound wave tool, which is modeled from my voice whispering a secret. So I actually took um, like the, the 3D waveform, sorry, the 2D waveform that you see in like a recording software. And I rotated that in uh, a 3D fabrication software and then 3D printed that and cast it in glass, which is the tool that you see here. Um, so I take that tool and roll it around in the sand in a bunch of different locations. And in addition to telling that secret, this piece is also a call and response because uh, on the right, my body is moving Ear through the sand. Trapped within the top layer of the dune. Mute that again. So I'm moving my body through the sand and that sound that you hear, that avalanche booming is also kind of embedded in uh, those recordings are embedded in the soundtrack along with that National Geographic narrator whose name I don't know. <laughs> um, so in that way, I kind of think that I'm eliciting a response or listening to the voice of the sand, even though it's just a small uh, spectrum of frequencies that the human ear can hear. Uh, let's see. I also use that green screen suit which is um, the reason that uh, I can digitally overlay the striations of the land around me um, and kind of become the landscape in my own body. And then we have learning to not drown. Like all chameleons, it can change its skin color. However, its color changes are not just about communication or camouflage. Here, the Namakwa uses color to regulate its body temperature. So this piece is about um, healing a bruise through that color changing effect. So when I touch it, um, it changes from purple to green or the later stages of a bruise. The heat of my body or the heat of the sun um, or any heat really would change that color. Um, it's because it's created, uh, treated with that thermochromatic paint. Um, this is about the act of healing as sitting with pain, which is that reference to the title in Learning to Not Drown. So even pain sedimented in the body over time, uh, sitting with it uh, without drowning in it in order to heal by embrace rather than getting rid of it. In this performance, everything becomes the chameleon and takes on methods of adapting the way a chameleon does. So the landscape, my body, the sculpture, my bikini change dynamically and blur together. Uh, by blurring the lines of definitive characteristics of all these elements, um, I guess I'm trying to challenge the objective point of view of that scientific narrative. Cool. Ava, you want to take over? Thank you both. That was beautiful. OK, hello, everyone. Um, this is just the, the MFA website. Um, so this is my page on it. Um, and I call this body of work the Atlas of the Disappearing. 
because it really um, delves into the idea of sort of duplicity in that uh, the way that the earth is changing and the way that we are sort of changing reflects each other, but is also um, a paradox because it is such a huge, massive, expanding shift that it is rendered immediately abstract and yet it is so intimate at the same time it affects everything in in ways that are both seen and unseen that are felt and understood and yet totally uh unfathomable or each of these paintings in this body of work are paired in some way either as a diptych or as these two they're just a pairing and i think of these as non-identical mirror images they reflect each other, they invert each other to a degree, but they're also non-identical, um, but they're kind of in conversation with each other. Uh, these two are called uh, Entangled and Ensnared, and they reference bodies tangled in uh, ghost nets, which are byproducts of industrial fishing, and they are detrimental to marine life across the world. Um, so these paintings, uh, are kind of flowing and amorphous from afar, but then as you get closer to them, oh, well, this is further away, but as you get closer to them, you uh, begin to see that there are these entanglements that entrap them. Um, so there's this sort of interplay of both being constricted and also kind of exploding. Um, imploding and exploding is another sort of diachronically expressed theme. So these are just to give you a sense of when you look more closely at these paintings, these, this line work, which is um, pencil or chalk um, or graphite that is over the paint. And then this pair is called Shadow Time and Epoquitude. And these paintings are uh, made up of many, many layers of thin washes of paint, and then also of uh, paper that is embedded into the landscape of the painting itself. Uh, this painting has the most representational form. And going back to the idea of the atlas, I see the, the representations as kind of points of entry to help the viewer navigate throughout the spaces that are created by these landscapes. Uh, and I see landscape as the overlaid arrangement of, of life on earth as both a kind of external geographic or geographical or geological uh, expression, but also as an internal expression. Um, we are extensions of nature and yet ironically, we constantly other nature. Uh, and I use abstraction to sort of um, speak the language of nature to nature, uh, rather than trying to define it with representation, which is a very human language. I instead use abstraction to try to give it space to exist in the realm of the undefined. And some of these uh, areas you see are, demonstrate the various layering that exists in this painting. There's also a sense of motion that is non-directional. It both signifies sort of the, the continuous cycling of especially water on earth. All the water on earth has always been here. It just transforms again and again. And here you can see some of the layers. So there's a lot embedded in these paintings on the surface to sort of, to signify that there is so much there dependent on each other. You know, each layer rests on, on the next layer and yet it comes up from below and you see that there's language sort of embedded in there, but it's incomplete. And then this one from above, from within, drench the fires that chase us. And it's the, the white formation is supposed to evoke both fog and smoke. Uh, and fog is a life-giving force and smoke is the residue of fire, which in the case of the California landscape, which inspired this work, is uh, detrimental. It's, it's tragic. Um, the wildfires are um, a major threat to all life in that region. And so I thought it was 
interesting that these sort of cloud formations could signify both something very positive and essential and life-giving, as well as something very destructive. And I, I'm going to leave it at that, actually, because uh, I think that we want to get into the conversation. Um, so I'll stop screen sharing for the moment. Uh, and I think we wanted to begin with discussing landscape. Um, so clearly in my work, I deal with landscape as sort of an abstracted idea or an expanded idea as something that is both internal and external. And I try to connect them via modes of abstraction um, so that we can, as viewers, navigate between them and, and reinforce and lean into that connection um, in hopes to move people. Um, but both Jenna and Anea also use landscape. And that wasn't, that wasn't anything that was intentional for the three of us. We, we weren't like, oh, let's all deal with landscape. But it was actually extremely organic that all three of us from basically the beginning of the program had these really interesting overlaps in our work. We were both, we were all fascinated with landscape specifically, but we all come from very different angles. And, and I think our work actually meets, brings those together in a conjunction of ideas of landscape. That's really beautiful and poignant. Um, so it's nice to, for us to have this MFA show um, where there is this sort of continuous idea ex being explored. So uh, who wants to talk about <laughs> landscape in their work next? It is pretty in interesting how we all entered like with ideas of landscape from all different perspectives. And then in our cohort, like read lots of um, articles on like changing landscapes or the concept la of a landscape and um, like dominion over, or we, we talked a lot about maps because I was really interested in maps. Um, and then with Jenna, that was really interesting how her work has to activate a landscape because of like these expanded ideas of sculpture. Um, and so I, I wanna hear Jenna talk a lot about that actually, about how um, maybe some of her earlier um, sculptures in this building were leading towards like their proper engagement in a landscape because I, I, I think I was mapping everywhere that we, ha we were being, like our bodies were visiting. I was um, collecting the names of those places and sharing them that way. And then, um, yeah, I'm just start, starting to like outline all of, our, all of the intersections for us. Jenna? Yeah, I think um, back then I was, I was in like a preliminary stage of just trying to like activate sound. And, and then I was, I was actually just scuba diving um, and like rolling that secret around at um, dive sites off of Waikiki. Um, and so I wasn't really mapping. I was kind of like reverse mapping my, uh, my secret and um, letting that sort of wash away. And so it was a sort of like temporary recording in the landscape um, that I, I think became a part of that underwater geography, geology, geology, <laughs> and, um, or both. And yeah, I, I don't even really think about it as sculpture, even though that's a, an avenue I come at it from. But um, I really like what you said, Ava, about um, that, we have this tendency as humans to other nature. And um, I really think of what I'm trying to do as like subverting that um, huge tendency to triumph over nature, um, or to triumph over landscape, and instead um, becoming a part of it with uh, our bodies and um, through just sort of listening to it and engaging in whatever sort of maybe dialogue is too human a word, but um, just understanding in a, a holistic way as possible. 
So I'd love to hear how you both do that. I mean, Nanea, you touched on it a lot. Ava, um, I think there's something in the way that you describe mark making and breaststrokes and how that relates to like actual crises happening in the land. And um, I think I told you I wanted to ask about how that is personally relevant to you. Like, do you, do you actually see like specific connections to those crises and yourself, like your own body as you're making the process of those marks? Well, yeah, actually, um, I, well, I grew up in like a very rural forest setting um, that always felt extremely isolated um, and remote and kind of untouched in that way. Although in the Northeast where I grew up, every square inch of land has been touched, even if it has the feeling of, or the, you know, you think that it's really remote. Um, but what really threatened me when I was growing up um, and my way of life and what I knew and held sacred was um, fracking, which is a way of getting natural gas that is extremely invasive. And the area that I grew up in, which is um, sort of the, the top of the Appalachian mountain chain is a shale deposit and that holds a lot of natural gas. Um, and so that was really, you, you, we felt so removed from, you know, maybe the, the, talons of the industrialized world and the uh, urbanized world. And yet in order for that urbanized world to persist and to be supported, they had to invade these sort of feeling remote, untouched natural spaces. Um, but yeah, my, my mark making, um, especially the, the very tiny marks and like the little drawn lines to me signifies that idea of everything being interwoven, uh, that everything, this, you know, this vast space that we occupy is actually made up of, of all sorts of tiny life forms and tiny connections. And it's, it's unfathomably intricate and that it's really important to keep that in mind that you know, every layer that exists uh, supports everything else around it. And I've been thinking about that a lot with sort of fossil fuels or, you know, deep sea mining. Uh, and that idea that there are layers of minerals or ores or, you know, um, elements uh, that humans think is theirs. And we think, oh, well, there's all this stuff that exists under earth and is just sitting there that it, you know, it's not being used. So what's the harm in, in taking it? And I think that's just what we know, you know, all these layers have existed long before us. And it is so arrogant for us to think that they're not doing anything, that they're just, they're just stuck there in the landscape um, for us to exploit. Uh, so so yeah, so I guess, you know, I, I feel very deeply connected to all these ideas. And I think one of the reasons I went so large scale with my work is because I feel overwhelmed by them and I feel like they're so much bigger than I can really uh, fully grasp that I wanted to make work that felt overwhelming to me as I was making it. Um, and I'm really, I, I, I'm fascinated by both of your work, um, both you and Nanea deal with landscape in a very intimate way. Um, and both deal with it as sort of like a collaborative aspect, you know, whereas Nanea thinks of the pohaku as teachers um, and the land as teacher and kind of as you, I think we all deal with this idea of landscape as self or as a reflection of self or as an extension of self. And so to me, it's really, beautiful and interesting to see how your work individually encompasses that. Um, and so I, I would like to ask you guys about uh, action and motion um, because both of you work with that in a really interesting way. And um, I, I haven't heard you talk enough about, oops, Nanao just disappeared. Um, hey, sorry. 
I, so I, I think when I look at both of your work, I think a lot of dance in sort of this, maybe an, an expanded sense of dance where I see uh, Jenna moving across the landscape. And to me, it looks like she's dancing, especially because it's in this beautiful sort of slowed down motion. And it looks like different parts of the landscape and the body as landscape is sort of dancing with itself. And then Nanea, you know, and I know in Hawaiian culture, dance is such a powerful form of ceremony and expression. And I think of you as also doing this sort of collaborative dance with the Aina and, you know, pull, putting something embedded in the landscape and then pulling it out and working on it just feels like this beautiful dance. So I wonder if you guys could talk about what you think in that regard. I'll go first because it's like just right on the top of my brain. I just think of dance and movement when I'm underneath the shadows of a kukui tree or underneath the shadows of like a, a tree in the forest is like, I um, want to be the secretary first for a moment and like capture the message of what that tree is saying. And I know that I have to move fast enough and my hand has to um, holds a mark making tool that, that can actually transcribe what's happening. So I'll find like pieces of charcoal from out of the stream. And that charcoal was probably made by like a tree that was struck by lightning or like a fire that's been there a long time ago. And to me, finding those kinds of materials in the landscape and then finding the right time to use them is a kind of like ceremony and an, an, and an action, but it is like a, a dance once you get into the drawing or into the painting, um, like the gesture of it um, is very figurative. And, and that's how I connect it back to painting, but it's also like, you're, like you were saying, a, a kind of like ceremonial activity, like the tree has the best shadow when it's directly overhead, and so I kind of have this like aha or like a, a methodology of like being in the right place at the right time for um, a real significance and like creating significance in the moment. Yeah. Nanea, before I forget, can we look at your piece, uh, Halavai? Because I think oh, yeah. that has a lot of like- Like behind me? Yeah, it has a lot of like dancerly or painting oh, the water strokes. Yeah, with the water. I'd love to hear you talk about uh, <laughs> yeah. Or we you can screen share or whatever. I don't know how to do all of this technology, you guys. It's <laughs> it's been such a huge learning curve, but that's the piece Halavai in the gallery. Yeah. And it's a canvas on top of another canvas. And that's a, a layering like like duality of form. But there's another layer, which is this atmospheric layer of water and um, the, like the marks of like dreaming with that mar that water. And so to me, like movement and a dreaming landscape, like taking that term from describing Aboriginal artworks and Aboriginal um, storytelling, their dreaming landscapes is a way to talk about being in a place within your mind. And um, halavai is a word that means like the horizon or the zenith. And um, if you can put yourself in the concept or in the place of mind of a, a horizon line, this, this canvas behind me is looking up and looking down at the same time. So looking um, up at the sky and also down at the water and also at a vanishing point behind these canvases. Um, there was an ahu that was on top of the canvas layer and I removed the pohaku and there was um, a kind of like registration mark that was left behind by that activity. And I'm layering all of those atmospheres into the, this, the finished moment of this painting, Halavai with all of its dreaming of Waikia Kua's dream. Can nice. you talk about your work, Jenna? <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about yours? 
Um, okay, well, we were talking about movement. I think it's really, oh, somebody said a comment or a question. Anyway, um, yeah, it's really interesting how all of us kind of use ceremony and uh, a sort of like ritualistic movement, ritualistic in the sense of like repetitive and and meditative um and even i don't know if you if i don't think ava you had like maybe some far back process videos where you're painting and you know you're kind of just like even though you're creating a lot of different strokes with like the same brush like you're you're um kind of doing the same movement over and over again um and somehow like creating a lot of different things from that and um i see that kind of happening with uh, like the tool that is the secret is that I can repeat it a number of different times and it, it kind of forms to the contours of the landscape completely differently um, in different settings. So when it's underwater, it's, it's sort of uh, in the prequel piece, Deepest Darkest Secret One, Master Piece of Love, it's, um, it's like forming to the sand at the bottom of the ocean. So um, the way that the waves make marks uh, on that sand, I'm like re replicating that in a really mechanical human kind of way. Um, and then when I do that in the desert, it it sort of becomes a part of these these crevices and like yonic forms. And so I actually have to even just slightly like change and adjust my whole body in order to um, become a part of that space. And uh, it's hard to see in a performance video because it's all, you know, like you try to cut it really beautifully together and make things really fluid, but actually it's like this really awkward hike to the middle of somewhere and, you know, I'm sweating in a green suit and like really like <laughs> kind of employing some survival mechanisms in order to get to that place in order to do that. Um, ritual, so I see it as more of like a type two fun, like putting myself through some pain of initiation in order to transform um, and to like just go way out of my way as much as possible in order to um, be a tiny bit less human. Um, and I don't, yeah, I, I guess you could consider it dancerly. I think that everything is um, a sort of dance the or a sort of speaking back and forth like the grooves of the sand being sedimented in sandstone some of those sandstone are the navajo sandstone which are actually like ancient sand dunes that um, have sedimented and become almost like rock but sort of soft rock that continues to be um, marked by the wind and transformed into a different shape just on a different time space than we do or the the sand the newer sand dunes do um, or the sand at the bottom of the ocean which is even newer um, and so I think it like those movements kind of tap into this time space that is just um, has infinite possibilities and yet it's still um, it's still speaking something or doing something there's there's still some sort of ceremonial at least in my perception some sort of ceremonial action happening regardless if we uh intervene or exist at all <laughs> so i just wanted to tap into that it's phenomenological and um yeah it's interesting it reminds me of a microscope in a way or something that humans have invented a technology to see what's there that we can't see and i feel like you're using technology like a drone or the green suit in order to demonstrate this internal experience, you know, to, to make seeing the unseen but understood. We know it's there, but we can't see it. So I think your use of technology is really interesting for that reason. Yeah, thank you. Robots are fun. <laughs> yes. Should we um, look at yeah, I wanted to I wanted to um, answer Rebecca's question about moving forward about like water water landscapes or just like social landscapes that are changing because I think social landscapes um, 
actually relates to the question that someone asked right before Rebecca's question about um, the pandemic and how it affected our show. And I think that we should just as like three person female show just kind of like say how disappointed we are, but also how much we grew from the experience of having our show ideal change so drastically like and and with nothing to be done about it too um we all spent the summer like creating work that was gonna uh relate to an online for like platform and so for me documentation became um such a a heavy priority like making sure that what I what I'm doing like while it's all like leading to my studio practice or like my methodology of making it's also leading towards being able to share this process even more efficiently so the the videos that I was started creating the videos that Jenna started creating um we we were getting ready to talk about these like really deeply effectual topics on a like a kind of like bigger internet scale like a scale for the world to access not just like people in Hawaii who can come to the gallery which is also really nice because that's that's our social landscape and and how we can bring people back to galleries or back to each other's like community work being together um I think that the, the, the methods and the materials of all three of our shows has something to lend towards that experience of being isolated, but then also doing things to combat a, an isolated feeling, doing things to share despite the fact that it is kind of hard to share right now. Yeah. What do you, what do you think about your video? like documentation, Jenna, like pre, pre-pandemic and, and now? Well, I do make these really touch-based works. And so it's been an interesting, like I think collectively we've all been really starved of touch and presence. And that's a sort of collective trauma that we're experiencing and like coming out of right now. Um, as far as video work, I, I think there's something else completely that can get uh, that can come across, which goes back to that sort of tapping into a time space that um, constantly exists and may exist beyond us, beyond us, which is the internet. And, um, you know, what does that mean for the works that we're creating and the ways that we're engaging? Um, you know, like, does it, does it matter um, how many people view something or how many people are present, um, who gets included or excluded in that conversation. And um, I think it actually is beneficial in that way because it becomes a bit more accessible and democratic. Um, I couldn't have had um, people that I, you know, family and friends I know from all over the country and all over the world be present um, for like the real deal um, if that stuff wasn't online. So, um, and I feel like I've just been, as artists, we've been reacting to the isolation and distance. There's no way uh, to not to. Um, and I think one of the ways, or a couple of the ways we've done that is by, you know, exploring uh, internally, um, kind of going within the self and, um, and exploring the language, at least I've been exploring kind of the language of intimacy there in relationship to land. And that is sort of a foundation for all other relationships so that when, um, when things do come back into play and in, in a social way, there, there's more engagement, there's more room for empathy with other people with, um, you know, what I would consider like non-human entities um, such as the land. And I think that that reciprocation, if we can come out of it with um, some sort of a collective healing having taken place, then that yeah. reciprocity uh, is already there um, and it's already transformed. And I think that that is only a positive thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. 
like coming out out of the other side of something with like knowledge I I yeah. think I'm relating that to like these like cosmogonic just like myth mythologies of like you know when the world is being created there's like these baskets of knowledge and like it's a epic tale it's an epic journey like going through all of the chaos and all of the um upheaval in in order to like have this like basket of knowledge or like doctrines that keep you like living in balance really like not kind of like defeating the enemy but actually just having learned so much that we can have these ways of not be be combusting or like coming like falling into dust but also like having form like I, I think that that's that's what I am taking a, as a big reflection of my process is um going through all of this like the the way you sit with your work is finding these like solutions that pertain to you and that intimacy and that healing for you and so what we're really looking at on the other side of all of this like three year studio intensive work is the solutions that fit the intimacy of our creative processes, of our environments, of our um, connections to, to Aina, to land and the changing landscapes, so the, the problems, and the entanglement of landscapes. So that's pretty cool, huh, Eva? I know you, you got to say something about that because that's <laughs> yeah. Well, that's my that's my cue that's entanglement. Your cue. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, yeah. No, I mean, I I agree with everything you're saying, and I mean, to me, and and I've said this before. There's such a parallel between what's happening with global warming, the climate crisis, extinction, and what's happening with the pandemic. The pandemic is like a even though the pandemic feels huge and overwhelming and we're still in the midst of it, it's actually a microcosm for what's happening in, in an even larger scale in a larger time frame. Um, and that to me, it's all about vulnerability. You know, this idea that, you know, the pandemic happened because humans interfered with natural systems in multiple ways. You know, we encroach on wild animals and wilderness. Um, we are a globalized world now in a way that really hits home. Um, and yet that globalist, globalism has um, benefited us in being able to have these Zoom conversations in an online show and being able to access and have conversations despite you know, geographic distance. But you know, that, that globalism, that globalized world, that human interference with, you know, and again, I say natural cycles, which is othering nature, but it's this continuous process of we, we create this language that others, others nature, and yet we have no other way to talk about it. Um, but I think it's really interesting where we're in this point where human animals can affect global phenomenon like weather, um, like climate, and like viruses, and yet we're absolutely still vulnerable to them. So just the fact that we can affect them doesn't change that we are still part of this planet and part of this landscape and, and we suffer too. Um, and I also just think of the parallels of a sick land and a sick people, you know? We are floundering as a species right alongside the, the Aina that's floundering, the ocean that's floundering, the, the air, you know, uh, we, we can't separate ourselves from it, even if, even though we continuously try um, or to hold dominion over it, because we still uh, are beholden to it in the end. I want to ask a question because we, we started discussing it, like, in, in planning this talk, Ava, but what do you think is the most, oh, shoot, I did it again, sorry. My phone's dying. <laughs> um, uh, I just have to ask Ava about what need, cause you work in multimedia, what media has been able to shift people's perspectives to noticing 
these like drastic changes or or where their their impact is you know like is do you do you notice that perspective shift change when people watch your videos when people see your artwork or when they read your poetry because for me that's I, I think that the, the language that you use has always shifted my perspective, especially when you start you speaking different languages, like saying Aina and, and really like being able to use that in conversation with multiple um, communities. So yeah, talk about that, Ava. Well, language is an interesting topic for you too, Nanea, because, you know, we, you know, one thing that living in Hawaii as Malahini has taught me is the importance of recognizing the, the, the original names of places and that using those names is, um, is a really important way to start to break through the, the systems of, you know, the systemic oppression on multiple levels. It's oppression of the natural way of things and of the people too, you know, they're, they're never disconnected. Um, but yeah, for me, I, I think that, I think of all of these media as different forms of language expressing the same thing. And so I try to use all the languages that I can to express these ideas because I'm trying to speak to, and to use another amazing Hawaiian term, the na'au, you know, I want to speak to the gut of people, you know, which is deeper than the heart. Um, and I think the, the gut, the heart, the soul speaks languages that are unexpected. And yeah. so you have to use all the languages you can because you're not ever sure exactly which one is going to hit there. Um, but, you know, we're, we're speaking that, you know, that's what art is about, because they always say, you know, even just politically, in order to make people act, to change their minds, you need to speak to their hearts. So I think that that's where art is really at its strongest, you know, because it's more than just an intellectual concept. It's something bigger that need, requires more than one language to address because it's multidimensional. And it's interesting too, because for me during the pandemic, I, I decided to like pare it back, you know, that it like my response was to focus and simplify and do only paintings as opposed to doing poetry and performance and video. I, my, you know, like everyone has a different reaction and mine was to like, kind of like self-contain. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it, it's just interesting how our work was affected in, in many ways. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, does anybody in the audience have a question? No, I'm looking, I'm checking out the chat. You're also, all of you out there in the audience are welcome to turn your camera and sound on and just like pop up and ask us a question in person too, because we love to see your faces. I'm going to move inside too, because what if my phone dies? Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess we have to start wrapping up pretty soon too, but I think we have time for, yay, Sequoia, ask a question. <laughs> do, you, do you know we can see you? I can't see her. I don't know. I guess like branching off of what you said about like how your art is affected, do you do you feel like you can see how your art's gonna go like in the future? Like and how that affects like it's happening right now is gonna like further enhance like everything you've been doing. <laughs> I'll talk about materials really quickly because maybe I didn't um, specify about my materials where I'm gathering them from the Aina. So going to different places and finding the colors of Alaya that are um, deposited from the watersheds of that place. That's, that's kind of like my work moving forward is like continuing to map and gather the names of places so that um, people can engage in those resources, those language resources or those um, 
geographical resources, but I I want to be able to share access to pe- for people to make things that will give them real benefit to their cultural lives. Like just being able to show people that materials for art making are not always bought from the store, but they're grown in the landscape or they're gathered from places with showing enough respect. You can really like learn. And and I hope in moving forward, that's what my work does is to um, help people to learn about where they live and how they can transform their landscape to be like in a harmonious relationship. Oh, my Lindsay. Oh yeah. Lindsay wants me to mention the uh, Manoa Heritage Center workshops. And we de- we're, I think just all over the Aina, there's, some, there's people with places and access to resources where um, it doesn't always have to be like a workshop or like with a like, like goal in mind, but just to experiment. I think that studio artists or just even cultural artists at it, in their um, home studios, um, we have to be able to start sharing our experimentation and, and like what we're learning from our material and what we're learning from our place names, what we're learning from our ohana before they um, like move to outer, uh, outer places or move on. Um, what materials and like moving forward, that's the mapping technique is like making sure that we document what we have and how it changes. I think that's exactly the relation between um, all three of our work actually, documenting what we have and how those things could change. Jenna? Want to answer um, yeah. a question? You can if you if you want. Oh, well, with kind of like what's happening next or in yeah, what's happening next with you? Um, yeah, I don't I don't know. I think I just I will venture out on and in some other way and try to kind of tap into the same like ever changing dynamics that are occurring. Uh, and I don't I don't really have like too many ideas right now but I I know that I you know I just don't know we don't know how things are going to change this is a very uncertain and unpredictable uh kind of time that we are in like as soon as we think things are getting better um and in certain like in some places in the world they're getting much much worse and so um I don't know if I can help people engage their with their bodies in the way that I want to with sculpture um, and directly touching things. Um, uh, specifically, I'm thinking about using sensors and, and having people just use their, their presence to kind of activate something or using their voice or other senses um, to kind of engage with video in a more um, encompassing bodily way. Uh, because, you know, I don't know, if my videos can, if people can exist in spaces with my works um, and play with sound in that way. Um, so I'm just, you know, kind of ready to like go with the flow and see how I can do that. I'm excited to engage in community and both like art and non-art ways, um, but I, I don't really have anything until I see how things are starting to change. I think I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> It's very uncertain right now. The website stuff is always um, kind of what we've gained as far as skills being at the yeah. university. We're really lucky for that. But yeah, so Micah, Micah just posted in the chat the um, link to the website for the MFA thesis for mm-hmm. this year. Um, I, am, I just want to mention before everybody has to go and, and get their things going, the Commons Gallery, I'm installed until um, May 7th. That's when I'll be, that's the day I'll be deinstalling. And so if you want to come and um, handle some Walke material, some kappa making um, experience is being offered from three to five 
every day that I'm installed in the gallery. Um, Sundays is free parking. So if you want to come to the art building and park in the parking lot, that's the best day for you to come and bring your family and um, look on the outside of the window gallery. But if you come from three to five, you can um, hand, you can go inside the gallery and you can handle the wall game material as it's transforming through my time in this space. Um, what I'm doing is taking my strips of wauke and beating it into um, sheets, whatever sheets I can, and laying them back on top of their um, canvas surface. And so the, all of the arrangements that you see walking past the Commons Gallery is um, set to change and be a kind of temporary um, composition for everyone to see it coming together. So come to the Commons Gallery. I, I think Deborah has a question. Well, first of all, comment. I just wanted to say congratulations. Like it's been such a pleasure to work with the three of you uh, over this time period, over three years, and for Nea over a decade. So just to see the maturity and the growth in your work, I think is really amazing. Um, I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, that you're each coming from a particularly gendered viewpoint in your, in your discussion of the land. And I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and about um, ecofeminism, how those ideas uh, enter into what you're doing, if that's relevant to your work or, or just your own bodily relationship to the land, to nature, to these ideas. Who should go first on that question? What? Who should go first? <laughs> I, well, I guess we sh we're I guess we're coming to the end of the, our time too. So if we like, if we answer, we should all just do a quick answer. I mean, of course, this is yeah. a I know, very dense like subject. <laughs> this is the this is the best question for the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this could be a whole yeah. This could be a whole yeah. discussion in and of itself. Um, but yeah, how do we talk do, about yeah, the feminine? If anybody feels inclined to answer, that would be great. <laughs> well, I think that all of us are trying to disrupt, you know, political economic systems that have been kind of um, the dominating systems uh, for for a long time. <laughs> and uh, and I think that like ecofeminism at its core is that's, you know, what it's trying to do is disrupt the systems and sort of realign them, you know, to um, a more kind of coexisting uh, space um, and, and creative and enriching and nourishing, which are, you know, things that um, are more associated with the feminine as opposed to domination and submission and, um, you know, capitalism, which tend to be more masculine systems traditionally, you know, I mean, just in terms of even semantic discussion. All right, that's my short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Good short answer. We'll go with that. <laughs> I, I'll share an anecdote because I, I don't really know how to politically talk about feminism, except that, you know, my body is implicated in every single decision politically that that has to do with feminism and so there's that gravity of like you know we have to live these things these issues and so um I'm going to start with an anecdote that's about me building my ahu um the first few times that I was practicing that my ceremonies in the forest I was creating these like forms just out of um instinctual like an ahu is normally like kind of rectangular or square. And then when I was talking with other cultural or spiritual people about my ahu building, they're like, oh, your ahu is kind of like very male, isn't it? It's, it's very masculine. And I was like, really? How come? Like, what, what if, what's your take on that? And they're like, I think it's just the angularness that you're coming at it from. You're trying to make control and make something. And it's reading very masculine. It's too much about control. And I was like, huh, you know, like I actually should take that critique and, and sit with it a while. 
And what it did was it, it allowed me to get back in touch with like the, the non-control, like allowing a process to organically happen. And so my ahu actually changed shape and became more of a, a circular stack instead of like something with like angular corners and stuff. And so that's just my anecdote about femininity is that okay. it kind of happens naturally. You, yeah. you can't avoid the, the transition or the form of things. It kind of just is you. So, yeah. That's the first time I've heard that story. So that's really interesting to hear. Yes. <laughs> I want to give Jenna a chance to answer as well and then kind of wrap things up if it's possible. Yeah, I'll try to do this quickly. I mean, I like everything that you both said. I, I think of my work as, um, you know, in direct contrast to that uh, element of control and categorization and definitive knowing of things, putting things at, in a space that is understandable, um, that is uh, is not really a feminine approach to things. And, um, you know, people, faculty have, have pointed out that um, the, the different land artists who intervene in in the land in a um, in a not very discreet way in a way that um, that is permanent and um, I, I haven't totally thought through um, how exactly I fit into that context but I know that I want to make marks and I have been making marks that are ephemeral and that speak directly to that fluidity and transformation that is um inherently feminine and so um under and that there is value in understanding things in that way even if it's not the dom dominant system of understanding things um so that's all uh, i want to thank you three for um your beautiful thoughtful conversation today um, and for making your important work and sharing it with us um, through your exhibitions, through your online exhibition um, and, and your continued advocacy uh, of each other and, and your exhibitions and your own work has been so moving and beautiful and thoughtful um, throughout this year. It's been really a, a, a wonderful learning experience to, to work with you three. Um, and uh, I wanna thank, the Zoom community for showing up um, and coming through to these talks. This is the last of our talks this year, but it's really, um, I know personally for me, helped me feel connected to a community uh, during a very, uh, you know, atomized time. Um, and I want to congratulate you, Ava and Nenea and Jenna, um, for your wonderful work and on uh, the completion of your. Um, MFA degrees and, and um, so yeah thank you thank you so much and and congratulations and um, I, I hope people can come through and see the exhibitions um, free parking on Sundays <laughs> come come and see the show um, okay thank you uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you Micah for hosting us and this has been really really amazing so yeah mahalo to you for real. <laughs> Yes. I'm going to go before my phone dies. I'm going to pop into the gallery and, and I'll be here. So everybody come and visit me in the building. Ahoy ho.